Yeah. All right, I think we can um, get started now. So it's really a pleasure to have Renit Rubenfeld visiting us today uh, from MIT and Tel Aviv, uh, foot in both camps. Um, and Renit and I grew up in the same hometown of Ann Arbor, Michigan, a year apart, but we didn't actually meet each other until we got to graduate school at Berkeley. She was my first friend in graduate school, and during the four years that we overlapped, we were pretty inseparable most of the time. So uh, it's really nice that she's here visiting us. Her early work in property testing um, laid some of the technical foundations for the celebrated PCT theorem on hardness of approximation. Um, and recently, she's been a pioneer in the area of sublinear algorithms and local computations, which she's going to tell us about today. So welcome. Thank you very much. Um, so it's great to be here. Thank you. For, can you hear me? Is your mic on? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, you may need a, just a oh, little closer. Yeah. Location. Is this better? Yes. yes. Okay. Good. We got it. Um, all right. So thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. And um, I, and if you pay me enough, I'll tell you stories about Sandy. <laughs> but the, in the meantime, I'm going to talk about local computation algorithms. Uh, this is a model that we um, are interested in because we're interested. What's the what do you do when you have huge inputs, so large that you can't actually see the whole input? In fact, not only do you have large inputs, but you're trying to solve a computational problem where you also have a large output. Okay, um, and what do you do in this case where the output is so large that you don't, not only can you not see the whole output, you don't actually need the whole output, you just need some piece of it. Okay, like maybe the input is, a large graph, and you want, and the thing you want to compute is a large independent set, uh, and you want to figure out not the whole independent set, but just whether your node is in the independent set or not, okay? Or just just your little neighborhood, what's going on in the neighborhood, or maybe um, I'll give a bunch of other examples in a minute. But when you don't need to see the whole output. Do you actually need to compute the whole output? Maybe it's possible just to compute your piece of the output without computing the whole thing. And furthermore, if you don't need to compute the whole output, you actually need to look at the whole input because it's huge and it doesn't fit in your computer necessarily. Okay. So that's what we're interested in is we'd like to figure out when you can just compute your piece of the output much faster and not even look at all the input and get some kind of reasonable solution. Okay, so this kind of model has been studied, actually, in many contexts. So one example is something called locally decodable code. So this is something that's been studied over the last 20-some years, uh, 20, at least six years, maybe much more, actually. Um, these are codes where you have um, your input. Now think of your input as the encoding of a very large message. So it's a really large <coughs> message, and it's encoded. And now. Not only do you not want to decode this whole thing, maybe you just need one bit, or maybe you just need to do binary search on the decoded message, okay? Can you somehow decode just the bits that you need faster? And there are codes <coughs> which have this local decodability property where you don't actually need to decode the whole thing. Some codes don't allow you to do this, but they developed a whole bunch of new codes which have all the good properties of the old codes and allow you this lo local decodability. There are similar things for compression schemes. Um, there are schemes which allow you to compress and achieve the same or similar types of compression as something like level <coughs> zip, but they also allow you to locally decompress. So if you have like a huge gene bank and you want to compress it, um, but now you want to run some algorithm on this gene bank, do you have to decompress the whole gene bank in order to run your algorithm? No. You, if not if you use these uh, locally compressible schemes, you can actually just decompress the parts that you need. Okay, so that's another notion. Uh, there's something called local property reconstruction where you may want to somehow correct your input. Like maybe your input is all alphabetized and you'd like to correct <coughs> it so that, um, you know, it's supposed to all be al alphabetized, but some small fraction is not in alphabetical order. How do you know, if it's completely non-trivial, if you just look at it at a name, is this in the, is this one of the 
the names that's not in alphabetical order because what, what would you do? You could see, I could compare it to its neighbors, but maybe its neighbors are also not in the right alphabetical order. Uh, so maybe I could look a little bit farther away. So there's things you can do to actually fix your data on the fly, but not by looking at the whole input, but just looking at small pieces um, under a certain distribution. And finally, there's actually a lot of interesting work on estimating page rank without looking at the whole you know, network graph. You know? And there's other sorts of community structure and dominating set questions. So there's a number of researchers that have looked at this. OK, so this type of question has occurred in many communities. These communities span you know, outside of computer science, inside of computer science, different areas. Uh, and it seemed like a good time for a model. So here's a model. Okay, so we call it the local computations model. And it was kind of introduced and sort of modified in these two papers with Tamir, Vardy, and Xi, and another one with Alon, uh, Vardy, and Xi. And we <coughs> call it the local computation model. It's also referred to by, by people in the distribute. OK, so I just want to say something. A, in distributed computation, there's a model called the local model. Uh, this is a sequential model. This is not a distributed model. Uh, so to distinguish it from this distributed model, people in distributed community often call this the centralized local model. Just So both of these are the same thing. But it's just if you're a distributed person, that's a confusing name. So a, And if you're a sequential person, then it seems to demonstrate what you want to talk about. Okay, so so here's, the, here's the deal. There's a huge input. It's so big you don't want to look at it. There's also a huge output. It's not even written down. You have to compute this thing. Okay? So uh, is it, should I be on the left or the right here? I, <laughs> <laughs> I <Okay>. vote right. <laughs> but that's right for me. <laughs> You're right. Okay. okay, I'll just switch. I'll just switch. <laughs> you can pay okay. back and forth. So you voted first. I'll start here. Okay, so you have this huge input. And you have a huge output, but the output's not written down. The input is written down, and let's assume you actually have random access to it. Okay? The output is not written down. You're trying to compute this. So now, okay, so now what we'd like this local computation algorithm to do is to somehow process queries. So you get these questions like, what is the output at location I want? <coughs> and then this guy, the local computation algorithm, he gets to make queries. He okay, let's distinguish the queries the local <coughs> computation algorithm gets. He's supposed to tell you what's the value of y at location i sub 1 from the uh, probes that the local computation algorithm makes to the input. Okay? So otherwise, we're calling everything queries, and it gets confusing. So these we'll call probes. So the local computation algorithm can probe the input at different locations. Let's assume it has random access, or it has some sort of data structure to the input, just normal, like, like you would have in sequential computation. So it makes these probes. Maybe looks at location J, looks at location K, and so on, makes some probe, and comes up with an answer and says, OK, location I sub 1 in the output has value Y sub I1. OK? Then it gets another query, Y sub I2. What is the value there? And the local computation algorithm makes more probes <coughs> and answers the Y sub I2. It does not know in advance what the queries are going to be. OK, so this is what, <coughs> this is the model. Uh, and in this model, a lot of work, I mean, this is from 2010, but all of these works are since then. Um, and a lot of <coughs> local computation algorithms have been designed. Uh, for example, maximal independent set, which I'm going to talk about much more in this talk. Um, approximate maximum matching by per type weighted vertex cover. Um, actually, what's interesting is this was um, even used, these types of algorithms were used in a learning setting by. Fahim Mansour and Shapiri. Um, it's been used for radio network broadcast scheduling, coloring for graphs, hypergraphs, uh, KCNF problems. Um, it's even been used in mechanism design by his <coughs> Mansour and Vardy, um, so local computation mechanism design, and online algorithms by Mansour, Rubenstein, Vardy, and Xi. Okay, so in particular, that problem is really interesting. Let's say you're doing a load balancing problem and you're throwing balls into bins. Okay, so now you want to figure out what bin did my ball get assigned to? Well, you could just redo the hash function. But there are more interesting load balancing questions. Often um, they have these algorithms that throw balls into bins, but they say, okay, let me pick two bins and see which one is more full and I'll send my ball into that bin. Okay, so now if I want to figure out where did my ball get thrown? I have to know all the previous balls. Do, well, that's the question. Do I have to know where all the previous balls got thrown 
in order to figure out where my ball would have gone because I have I can figure out the two bins you would compare, but I don't know how many balls that those two bins <coughs> have in them, so I don't know which one was the minimum weight. So do I have to go check all the preceding balls and see where they got thrown? And it turns out you don't. Okay. So all these problems you can solve with polylogarithmic probes to the input. And let me just stress again, we're talking about sequential algorithms. So these are polylogarithmic time sequential algorithms. So okay. Question about the model. So it maintains some state from one query to the next so that the answer can depend on earlier query answers? Okay, good, good. Uh, this is a great question. Let me repeat it because it's such a great question. Do you get to remember what you did in the past? Okay? Do you get to remember where, you, and in fact, um, there are models which could allow this. Today, I'm going to define a model where you do not get to remember what you did, your past decisions. That's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm not saying that that's not interesting. It is interesting. But, <laughs> but today, I'm going to talk about a model where you don't get to remember past decisions. And the reason is, um, so the reason is, uh, I'll get to the reason in a minute. <laughs> OK, because I have to say one thing before. Okay, so one of the difficulties in this is there may be more than one legal output. Okay, and and so what? You know, what's the problem with one legal output? Now I'm going to answer your question. Okay, okay. So the problem is this: suppose there is many LCAs running in parallel. Each one <coughs> is sequential. Okay, every single one of these guys is sequential, but they're running on the same input. And they're telling different people, you're assigned here. Your value is this, you know. And but they're they're talking about the same input, but maybe you know maybe this is like a travel agency, and they're answering <coughs> questions to customers, or maybe you know this, the input is the same for everybody, and they have to be consistent. Okay, so we're going to assume in this model that these different LCAs they're very sequential. They're not allowed to talk during the computation, but Let's assume that they can share an initial random string before they go out off into the world. Okay? I mean, if you prefer, just assume there's like an oracle in the sky with random numbers and I'm allowed to ask for the ith random number. And you know, me and David could, if we both ask about the ith random number, we both get the same answer. That's a, um, but that's what this short string is going to help us do. But we, we just assume we have a little bit of communication. And then after that, we're on our own. We don't get to talk. Uh, and then what we'd like to do is provide the illusion of a fully constructed output. Even though each one of us, you know, I might be answering about this part, David may be answering about this part, Sandy about this part, VJ about this part. And the parts where we overlap, we have to be consistent. And furthermore, if you take the union of all of our answers, if, you know, no, I mean, we're not going to do that, but if somebody later on investigates and looks at the unit <laughs> in all of our answers together, it should be consistent with the legal solution, okay? Even though we have no idea what the full thing is, and I have no idea what's happening over here. Okay, let me tell you when this happened to me. I was teaching a class, 300 people, course staff of 15. We're trying to compute, like we're trying to seat oh, people <laughs> so that they're every other seat, okay? Now, these guys are coming in like crazy, right? They, I mean, nobody came in half an hour before and sat down. There were three people, those guys we could seat. Okay, but then all of a sudden, 10 minutes before the exam starts, hundreds of people are coming in, and we cannot talk to each other. The course staff cannot talk, but we have to make sure everybody's seating in an, sitting in an independent set, and we had like a system so that it would be a large independent set because we knew seats would be tight. Okay, so we already agreed in advance what the system is going to be, and then we were all local computation algorithms. No, you can't sit there. No, you have to move. <laughs> and you, we moved everybody around, but it was all like, we, we had an agreed upon independent set that we were going to use. And they, that's, so that's a local computation algorithm. We provided the illusion of a fully constructed output. At the end, everybody was sitting, and nobody was sitting next to each other, so it kind of worked. Uh, so there you go. Okay, so it's a, all right. So we're going to assume that each of these is sublinear time, space, randomness, and that they cannot remember past decisions. Okay? I'm not saying that this is, a requirement in general, but they, there, are, there are some works that do remember past decisions, but for today, let's say you can't. Okay, so the biggest challenge here is consistency. Um, and it seems somehow, and I don't have a proof for why this should be the case, but this idea that it should also be query order oblivious, like because 
I, my answers shouldn't depend on past history, then also it shouldn't be the case that if I got asked uh, questions in different orders, that that should affect my answer. Okay, so somehow it, it seems that answering this, it seems that when we get one, we seem to get the other. I don't have a reason for that. Like I can't prove that this implies that, but that seems to be something we get. All right, so let me talk about, now that we've talked about the model, let's talk about like this sounds maybe crazy, how could you design an LCA? So let me talk about some methods of giving LCAs for different problems. <coughs> so I'm gonna talk now about general methods um, at a high level. All right, so let's, as a running example, take the maximal independent set problem, a, and which I know two people in this room know about this right now, so because <laughs> um, I spoke to you. And it's, um, okay, just, so we remember, maximal independent set is you're given, let's assume it's a sparse undirected graph, let's assume it's constant degree, I don't have to worry about the degree, and the degree is at most D. And a maximal independent set, we know maximum independent set, it's the famous NP complete problem, uh, but this is maximal independent set. This is just a set of nodes in the graph that have no edges between them. So the red nodes, there's no edge between any pair of red nodes. Right? Actually, it turns out there's also no edge between any pair of yellow nodes here. So those are two different maximal independent sets. Okay, and maximal <coughs> means it may not be the maximum, it may not be the independent set of the largest size, but you can't add any node to it and make it bigger. Okay, so if I added any node to this red set, if I colored any of these yellow guys red, there would, it would no longer be independent because there would be two nodes that have an edge. Like if I color this red, that would be bad because it has an edge with this guy and with that guy, okay? And for every yellow node, if I colored it red, it would no longer be independent. Similarly, by the way, if, um, I mean similarly, if I took any red node and colored it yellow, the yellow nodes would no longer be independent. That's this particular case. But there are two yellow neighbors. Ah, you're right. So. Ignore what I said about the yellows. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I was a little tired there. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so what, so what I, what I wanna say is, let's take this as, are there questions about this problem? It's maximal, not maximum, so it's not NP complete. It can be solved in linear time by a greedy algorithm, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. But, um, but this is something we can do. <coughs> okay, idea number one, is essentially distributed algorithms to the rescue. So I spent all this time telling you that this is a sequential model, it's not a distributed model. In fact, we named it different, they named it differently so you wouldn't get confused. But actually, we're gonna use distributed algorithms to help us. Okay, so why should distributed algorithms have anything to do with sequential algorithms? So I'm gonna talk about this reduction due to Parnas and Ron. Um, it says, if you have a K-round distributed algorithm for a problem, okay, so, then, let's think what happens, and let's think what happened for, okay, actually, wait. I have to say something about distributed algorithms because there were things that were like non-intuitive to me at least before I learned about this, okay? So, so people that don't work in distributed algorithms, it's a little confusing. So what's the input? The input to a distributed algorithm is the, net, is the underlying interconnection network, okay? So these distributed people they like have an interconnection network. I get to, to, you know, I have my neighbors that I talk to and they have their neighbors that they talk to. And now on that graph that we talk on, that's the graph that we're taking as our input. Okay, so there's no like other graph that we do query access to. This is just, it's the interconnection network. Okay, now let's say we want to figure out a maximal independent set. And why would, we, this is like an important problem in distributed <coughs> algorithms because a maximal independent set is a group of people that can broadcast without having collisions, for example. So maximal independent set for distributed algorithms is like an important tool and highly well studied. Uh, so, okay, so the maximal independent set is on the interconnection graph itself. Now, what is it, now we're gonna talk about the distri current distributed model that we wanna talk about is, what do I get to do? In one round, I get to send a message, and I get to receive a message, That's a, and I can compute something, okay? In the next round, based on the computation from the previous round, I can send a message, receive a message, and compute some more. That's what we do in a round. I get to send to my neighbors, receive from my neighbors. Okay, 
So now, if I have a k-round distributed network, then these outputs can depend only on inputs. Yes. Sorry, the interconnection network is known beforehand to everybody. No. Good question. Somebody. Would, the question is whether the interconnection is, network is known to everybody. No. All a node knows is his neighbors, his or her neighbors. That's all you get to know. Okay. So good question. Um, so now I want to claim that V's output depends only on the inputs and computations of the k-radius ball around V. Okay, so let's take, just to see this, what do I know in the beginning? Nothing, just I know my name. I mean, I mean, if I flip some random coins, I know those, that's it, okay? So my first message can depend only on my random coins and my name. And, okay, so I send a message based on that to all of my neighbors. <coughs> And then they, I get something from them in this round. And what they sent me only depends on their name and their random coins. OK? Now, so we do this for a round. Second round, what happens? Now my next message can depend on my name, my coins, my neighbors, their coins. And that's it. Just the one radius, one neighborhood. OK? And, but then I get a message from them. And their message depends on their neighbors. So now my, my next message can depend on radius 2. OK, so if I do k rounds, every time I do one more round, it only depends on one more uh, distance in the radius. OK, so that's why my output can only depend on inputs and computations of the k radius ball around. OK, questions on that? Yes. That's it. All right, now that's the. OK, that's a, general, that's a general notion about distributed computation. In k steps, like in k rounds, I can only hear from people that are within distance k, and that's the only <coughs> thing that can affect what I do. So if I had a distributed k round uh, algorithm that tells me, at the end of which I know whether I'm in or out of the maximal independent set, then that means that's all I need to know. I just need to know what these guys are going to tell me and then I can figure out if I'm in or out of the maximal independent set. Okay, so we can simulate this sequentially. Okay, that was a distributed algorithm. Everybody was working in lockstep and sending each other information. But sequentially, what would I have to do to figure out what this guy does? Okay, I would have to figure out their inputs and what they would have sent their neighbors. And then I have to figure out what, how they would have responded and what they would have sent their neighbors and so on. I only need to figure out for this ball. Uh, what the, so if I just read the inputs, okay, I'm talking about a sequential algorithm that has random access. Uh, the random access would just go to all these inputs, figure out their neighbors, do it like BFS, okay? Figure out their neighbors, figure out their random their names, figure out their random coins, and then simulate the distributed algorithm. Okay, but once I've read all the information, which is how big? Well. The graph has bounded degree d, and we're looking at radius k, so I can only be d to the k steps away. So I have a total of d to the k pieces of information that I need to read, and I can simulate everything sequentially. Okay, So I just need d to the k probes to the input. I can simulate everything sequentially and figure out what is the answer for v. Okay, So I'm taking the fact that there exists a distributed algorithm and I'm simulating it, but we just need d to the k. So this is what Parnas and Ron noticed. This is all great, but what if k is really big? OK, so that would be a problem. Like, k doesn't even have to be really big. It just needs to be a little bit big. Uh, so what do we do? Well, here's the cool thing. Distributed algorithms has gone sort of through a revolution in what they call local distributed algorithms. And this is distributed algorithms now. But they have developed these constant round algorithms. Incredible what they can do, OK? They can do amazing things in constant many rounds. It's just like they can solve L like packing LPs. They can, they can do all kinds of um, amazing problems and all in constant rounds. So this is like an area. So we're just going to take <coughs> the results and use them. <laughs> and that would be a cool thing to do. So that's uh, idea one. But for ma maximal independent set, let's see how far this gets us. OK. Well. We know that maximal independent set is not so easy to do in parallel because lexicographically first maximal independent set is actually p-complete, which means it's one of the hardest problems to parallelize. 
okay? So we know that's hard. So, okay, well, but then there's, you know, there was this Luby's algorithm in 1985 that gave you a log n round, a um, parallel algorithm for maximal independent set. So let's take k equals to order log n. What does that give us? Hmm, not so great, because look at this. It's 2 to the order log b log n. So it's polynomial in n, but we could have gotten pretty much linear time if we had just done the thing sequentially. So this is like no gain, okay? No gain at all. I mean, we should have just done the sequential. All right, so idea one prime. We're going to use distributed algorithms as sort of a tool, but we're going to just add some more ideas. Okay, so that's the plan now. All right, so I just want to give like a, a broad, I mean, the, I'm going to give like a broad categorization of how distributed algorithms work at such a high level that you're not going to get any information, but it's going to be enough for the next slide, okay? So, <laughs> so here is like a typical thing that distributed algorithms do. All the nodes would start out alive, okay? I mean, like we're all candidates, meaning live, meaning we're all candidates for being in the maximal independent set. And in each row, round, the people that are still alive that want to still be in the maximal independent set, they would toss some coins, and they would use those coins and some interaction with their neighbors, some discussion with their neighbors, to decide if they should join the maximal independent set. Okay? So there are different ways of deciding this. But this is a, uh, and then if you decide to join the maximal independent set, or your neighbor decides to join the maximal independent set, then you're kind of dead. I mean, you're, you're either in or you're out, but you don't have to worry about it. You're done. Like, you figured yourself out. Okay? So that's kind of a general overview of how a distributed algorithm might do these things. Is that clear? Um, and the usual thing that they would do is they would do this thing for enough rounds so that everybody dis everybody's dead. Okay? So you would, that's the usual distributed algorithm. <coughs> is you would say, okay, everybody runs this type of a round until everybody's dead. And dead, by dead, we mean we're either in the maximal independent set or we're not, but we know. <laughs> okay, so, so, so you know, you do it until everybody knows where they are. And that would take log n rounds, uh, usually. Um, and so, and that's a problem because log n rounds, remember our running time when we simulate was the degree raised to the number of rounds. So d to the log n, no good. So what we're going to do is we're just going to repeat until a constant fraction is dead. Okay? And a pretty good constant fraction. And the idea is this, that, okay, so we repeat this thing until a constant fraction is dead. Let's say the red guys are in the maximal independent set, the green guys are not in the maximal independent set, and there's some that haven't been decided. These yellow guys are still alive, okay? The, the red and the green, dead. They're decided. They know they're in or out. The yellow guys are still alive. But what you can prove, and you can prove this using um, essentially following a, an argument of Beck when he showed um, an algorithmic version of the Lovas local lemma. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. But there is a technique that was known that you can use to show that these remaining components are all small. And by small, I mean they're actually logarithmic size, polylogarithmic size. Okay? So now, okay, so you've done. So there's this like a distributed algorithm that needs only a constant rounds and it totally breaks up the graph. Everything's small. So we're gonna, so you can take that distributed algorithm, make an LCA for it. It's gonna be in D to the number of rounds time, which is gonna be a constant, so not so bad. And now you've completely shattered the graph. And now what you have is these small components that are logarithmic size, polylogarithmic size, and you could sequentially just do BFS, figure out the component, and take the lexicographically first maximal independent set, or just some, something that's fixed. It doesn't matter if you started here or you started here. This component has the maximal independent set that works for that component. So I, I recommend like, uh, thinking of it as lexicographically first, just so everybody agrees. It doesn't matter if the query came from this node or from this node. Um, that everybody would agree that for all those alive, this would be the maximal independent set we agree on. Okay, so let's say in the lexicographically first maximal independent set, maybe this guy gets the node purple, and this guy gets the node purple, and we're done. We have a maximal independent set. Okay? All right, so that would be the plan of how we're going to do it. Let me just, um, let me just uh, 
summarize what we did here. Okay, okay so, so we had. Do your yeah. components depend on everyone's random bits that they've used? Yes. Okay, and I've been hiding that. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, sorry, so I didn't mean to bust you. The, the com no, the components totally depend on everybody's random bits, but um. So they um, we're gonna simulate them by DFS. So the point being that these components are really small, and because we had this degree d bound, I mean, I was assuming a constant degree d on this graph. Okay. Um, so it means that also the neighbors of these guys are really small. And you can just, let's, let me try to answer this question in okay. a, just right now, out of what you would do. Okay, so it, it's a little complicated, because here I had a distributed algorithm, which we're simulating sequentially, then we're adding this other algorithm, and so let's, let's try to summarize where we are, because it's a little, uh, loopy here. Okay, so we had an order D round distributed algorithm, which was that distributed algorithm of Luby. We're going to run it constantly many times, but I'm assuming the de degree is constant. So actually, I kind of cheated. We're going to run it order degree many rounds, okay? So we're running order D rounds of Luby's algorithm. D is a constant. Um, we're going to prove that live connected components are all small via the Beck like analysis. Okay, so what this means. We're going to define a subroutine that's sequential called alive. And it's supposed to tell you if V is still alive after the first phase. Okay, and the way it's going to figure out if V is still alive is to simulate V's local view of the distributed algorithm that we just talked about. Okay, so that's going to be the degree raised to the order D many uh, rounds. Okay, so it's d to the d, but d is a constant. So it's exponential in the degree, which is why I keep harping on the fact that d has to be constant here. Okay? All right. So alive is order d to the d, but that's what it does. And it can sequentially, in order d to the d time, tell you whether v is alive or dead uh, after the first round. And it will look at the neighbor's random bits. It will look at everybody's random bits to do this. Okay? All right, good. So um, now, what does the LCA do? When I call it on V, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to call alive on V. You can see, is V still alive? If V's output is determined by alive, I'll put it. OK, otherwise, it's still, now if it's still alive, if it's not, like, if it hasn't been determined, then I have to determine it. So what are we going to do? We're going to find V's small live connected component by VF, VFS. We're going to do a VFS. To every neighbor, we're going to ask, are you still alive? And then continue, are you still alive? And we're going to find the connected component that's still alive next to V. Okay, and this, again, we're going to be looking at everybody's, everybody that we visit to do this. We're going to be looking at their random bits. And we can do this because we have to query access to everybody. All right, so we're going to just find the whole component. And once we do that, then we figure out its logarithmic size. We can just write it down. We're going to figure out if V is in the lexicographically first maximal independent set or not, and output based on that. Okay, so that's the whole thing. But there, I mean, it's a little conceptually mixed up because you have to, you, here you have to simulate a distributed algorithm, but let's assume you know how to do that, then you have to do this BFS, but you're continually calling this, this uh, routine on your neighbors and your neighbor's neighbors and so on until you find the full component, okay? All right, and it's just that we promised you, you don't have to go that far. You'll do, you'll call this alive while you're doing this BFS, and we have a promise, which we proved by a theorem, that you're not gonna have to go more than polylogarithmic steps to find everybody, okay? So that's the idea. All right, so this, I wanna say this is an idea based on shattering, and it was later improved and used, this idea of shattering by Barenboim et al. and Gaffari in 2016 with a lot of other ideas. And actually, uh, there's a recent paper that I'll just talk about. But in the last soda, a couple days ago, uh, there was a paper by Gaffari and Wito, which is even more amazing. Uh, so uh, they applied many other ideas on top of these ideas. Um, beautiful work. OK, so here's what happened. So we mentioned. Uh, that, we, that Luby's algorithm did not give us a really good sublinear time LCA, but with additional ideas and different algorithms, you can do a lot better. So a lot of these algorithms like uh, use this shattering idea. Baron boy Malkin actually existed way before. Um, it was a better distributed algorithm that was known before. 
all these ideas. Um, but they, and Evan Medina and Ron, I mean, there's a whole industry of take your favorite distributed algorithm for a maximal independent set and turn it into an LCA. So there are many different algorithms involved in here. But uh, the idea of shattering was used by Gaffari and Gaffari and Rito. Um, and they further showed how to sparsify the graphs. So this bound on D is not so bad anymore. So, uh, um, so before I go on to the bounds on D now, um, let me just mention that what happened is we were users of distributed algorithms. But what happened over time in the last few years is that uh, the distributed algorithms people, such as Gaffari and the uh, uh, many of these others started uh, writing local computation algorithms results as well. So Gafari's 2016 paper, for example, has both a better <coughs> distributed algorithm and a better LCA. Uh, and in fact, now it's kind of hard to separate between the two models um, be because when you get a new technique, it often works in both. On the other hand, somebody actually recently asked me, do you, do you think it's just distributed computation? Maybe there's no difference. Um, and I, um, I actually had a discussion with this with Mohsen Gafari uh, yesterday. <laughs> And like, what do you think of that? And he said, no, no, because you really are optimizing slightly different things. And it does lead to different ideas. Uh, because there's nothing in distributed algorithm that asks, they ask about the rounds, but they don't force you to minimize the total computation. Whereas here, we really need to minimize the total computation, not just the number of rounds. And so there really is a different way of thinking. And actually, uh, but it's still nice that the techniques in both have fed off of each other and kind of advances in one model have led to advances in other. And I think now the next place, the next model that's going to be connected to both of these is the MapReduce and, uh, uh, OK, MPC stands yeah. for what? MPC? Massively Parallel Algorithm. Ma massively Parallel Computation. So I'm married to a cryptographer, so I hear m m MPC, and I always say multi-party computation. And it's not. It's Massively Parallel <laughs> Computation. Uh, so it's, uh, OK, good. All right, so let me mention another idea for building LCAs, and that's to simulate the greedy algorithm. Um, and the, the idea that may come is that you have an LCA. Let's say you didn't have this opinion that you should uh, be independent of history. Maybe you should depend on your history. Then there's actually a really easy algorithm for maximal independence set. In fact, it's order D. Wait, did I skip? I think I'm going to get to it later. OK, that's the point. Good. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's order D. Because what I would do is I would see if any of my neighbors have been put in the maximal independent set yet <coughs> by previous queries. And if not, then um, I put myself in. But if they hadn't, you know, if any of my neighbors have been put in the maximal independent set, then I can't go in. But if none of them have been put in, then I can put myself in. So in order D time, with memory over the course of the computation, I could figure out whether I'm supposed to be in the maximal independent set. <coughs> now, this would not be query order independent. It really depends on what the query order is. And also, if I was doing maximal independent set and my TA was over there doing maximal independent set, we'd get a very different maximal independent set. So we would not be consistent. Okay? So that, that's a good thing to do if you're alone in the world computing. But it's not a good thing to do if you're trying to be consistent. But here's an idea where let's try to simulate greedy. Uh, which is run through the nodes in some order, put V in the maximal independent set if none of the neighbors have been put in the maximal independent set yet. And now what we're supposed to do is figure out what would greedy do on you, OK? Well, as we said, it depends on the order. You know, it depends what order we pick there. Once you pick the order, it's completely deterministic, right? It just depends on what nodes came before you in the order. That's it. So. You, if I want to figure out what greedy would do on you, I'd have to simulate the results of greedy for all the adjacent edges and nodes of a lower order. Okay, so I come in and I ask, oh, am I in the maximal independent set? Well, I have to look at all my neighbors that have, they come before me in the ordering and figure out, are they in the maximal independent set? And so on. I have to figure out their neighbors. And so, so the problem is the dependency chains could be extremely long. And what Nguyen and Onak showed is that most nodes are going to be okay as long as you pick a random order, OK? And they have a really cool technique, but they only show most nodes are OK. We need more than most. And it turns out with a slightly different analysis, you can get more than most. You can get everybody's OK. So you can show that random ordering gives you short dependency chains. So that's pretty cool. Um, so let's talk about how fast LCAs for maximal independence that can be. 
in terms of dependence on n, like let's assume degree is constant, all you care about is dependence on the number of nodes in the graph. Uh, what I talked about now gives you polylog n dependent. There's a work of Evan, Medina, and Ron based on a different distributed algorithm that gives you log star of n. So that's pretty cool. What about dependence on the degree? So I kept saying the de degree is constant for a good reason. It was like doubly exponential, something crazy, okay? So exponential, doubly exponential, terrible. Open question, can you get polynomial and D dependence? This is still open, but here's the improvement since then. Okay, so after exponential, we could get two to the log cube D. Then Gaffari in 2016 got it two to the log squared D. And now in this recent soda, um, we have two to the log D, log log D. Okay, so there's these beautiful sparsification techniques that take a graph with high degree and sparsify it, really beautiful techniques. Um, and it's built on top of everything else. Yeah. Do these results assume anything about the graph aside from the, the degree bound? That's it, nothing. Is there a headroom to, to do better if you, you say that you might know more about the sort of statistical properties of the graphs? Okay, great question. So there's a question that I'm gonna repeat. Um, the, what if you know something about the graph, that it's not a, like an arbitrary graph, but a special <coughs> graph? So yes, you can do much better. For, that's not me, okay, 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 okay good. Um, it's a, you can do much better for certain kinds of graphs. <coughs> So for example, for planar graphs, you can do great. You can do way better. Uh, a, any kind of, uh, a, like they d d don't have, like they don't have, cave, they don't have forbidden yeah. subgraphs. Like, graph, oh, yeah. like families of graphs that have forbidden subgraphs. So planar is an example. Like there's like small subgraphs that are not allowed to be in planar graphs. But if you're characterized by forbidden subgraphs, those types of families you can do way better. Like constant time and much better. Um, a, there, can you do better for expanders would be a good question. I have no idea. Um, but uh, there are certain families that you definitely can do better. Okay. Uh, good. So I think I'm... You should, go ahead and take a little more time. Okay, so I'm going to take a few more minutes and I'm just going to talk about types of problems maybe. And uh, see. Okay, so <laughs> the rest of the talk I was going to talk about a LCAs for sparse subgraphs of G that have nice connectivity. So I'm going to change topic and not talk about a, a, a independent set anymore. I want to talk about sparse subgraphs problems. Yeah. So uh, hopefully a quick question. So the, the, these algorithms <coughs> all include a coin flip at the beginning. Is there any probabilistic dependence on how good the algorithm can be as a function of that those coin flips? For example, could an adversary who controls the coin flips make your algorithm take longer than you claim in here? Yes. Is it amortized cost or is it adherence? No, it's case? um it's with high probability over the coin flips. Okay. So if you have if the adversary doesn't control your coin flips, then you can make it you can decide how unlucky you're willing to be. Like, you know, you can say, okay, I want to give a good answer with probability at least one over the number of atoms in the universe, and what you would pay for that is something like log one over the number of atoms in the That's universe. Uh, but, a, but you still would have a probability of failure. So you could control it, though. Um, it's not under any assumption of distributions of the inputs or anything like that, though. Um, and I do want to say that I think <coughs> this one is deterministic, actually. Uh, the Evan Medina and Ron. Or th there is something in there, is I think that's the one. This one is deterministic. So just to say there, because if the distributed algorithm was deterministic, then this reduction we talked about is deterministic. Like the reduction doesn't need more randomness, but if the original algorithm was randomized, then the reduction needs, I mean, the reduction is not gonna get rid of the randomness. So, the, um, so that's the, so th they just took a deterministic maximal dependence set approximation. Uh, so, we, um, okay, good. So, so I want to talk about a different type of problem, and that is how would you get an LCA for sparse subgraphs of G that have nice connectivity properties? Like maybe what I want, I mean, actually what we started with wanting is I wanted just spanning tree. I wanted to know is this edge in the spanning tree of the graph, okay? Uh, well, we'll talk about that, but so I just want connectivity. Like I just want a sparse connected, I just, I want a spanning tree of the graph or something like that. Or a spanner graph. This is a subgraph of the original graph that preserves up to a constant, it preserves the distance. So like it's a if 
it's a subset of the edges which is pretty small. And the distance in the new graph, which is much sparser, um, is for every pair of nodes is at most three times or k times the distance in the original graph. So I don't kill the, the, distance, the distance ability. Okay, so here again, your input is a graph G, and your output is a graph H, which is a subgraph of G. Same nodes, but a subset of the edges. Okay, and we're gonna ask now, <coughs> is the edge UV that is guaranteed to have been in the original graph G, is that still in this subgraph H? Okay. And we could ask various, I mean, I'm assuming the graph is represented by a data structure and it, you know, it allows uh, the following kinds of normal queries that we learn in our algorithms classes. Um, what's the ith neighbor of Y? You can assume that you have like an adjacency list and in constant time they tell you what's the ith neighbor of no Y. Okay, W. Um, they can ask, okay, is, are Y and Z connected in graph G? I mean, we're probing the graph G, the input graph. So I could ask, is there an edge between Y and Z? Okay, yeah, yes, no, <laughs> okay. And um, for these problems, so I wanna talk about sparse connected subgraphs. How many more minutes should I take, like two? Yeah, a couple. Okay, so then I'm just gonna say, um, okay, so I'll just say that it's what's hard and then I'll just say that it can be done, okay. So the objective is, given an edge UV, is it in the spanning tree? And, I, um, and a difficulty here, again, just like we had with maximal independent set, is to be consistent with the same tree. Okay, um, now, why is this pro a problem? Look at the problem here. This is a, a graph where, on this graph, we have to say yes on every single edge. I mean, this is a spanning tree of this. This graph G is a spanning tree. I cannot delete a single edge. Otherwise, it would not span, okay? So I have to say yes on every edge. This one, if I want a spanning tree here, I have to find some edge to say no on. Now, look at this edge here. How would he know if he's in this case or in this case? You know, without like, going out and following this thing, how would I know that there's, a, you know, if I'm in this case or this case? It looks identical unless I do VFS all the way out to the rest of the nodes. I need to go out and steps to see the difference. Okay, so that can be made formal into a lower bound proof to say <coughs> that this requires omega n probes to figure out w whether I'm in that case or that case. Okay, so that means I can't answer correctly on every single edge unless I take omega n probes. All right, so the simpler problem we're gonna talk about is sparsifying the graph because we can't do the other one in sublinear time while maintaining connectivity. Okay, so we're gonna allow a few extra edges. How many extra edges? Epsilon n extra edges. Okay, so what I would like to do is output yes on this subgraph H that might have one plus epsilon times n many edges, an extra epsilon n edges, but this H better be connected. Okay, it can be a little bit bigger than a spanning tree, but it better be connected. All right, so is this new easier? No, this also has a root n lower bound, but it is easier. Uh, and I think I'm kind of running out of time. So what I'm just gonna say is, um, this is a problem that requires root n, but doing it in root n is still open. So if you're looking for open questions, uh, there has been a lot of work on this, and, the, um, and it's like, a, so there's some preliminary work and also work on different classes of graphs. There was a question over here. For planar graphs, it's much easier. Uh, for planar graphs, you can do it in constant time. Um, but for, in general, to get a root and upper bound open, okay? Uh, we have the best algorithm right now is, <coughs> polynomial in the degree over epsilon times n to the two thirds. Um, but I think this probably can be improved. Um, and so that's a really good open question. Um, also, I mentioned the spanner problem, but I think um, I'm gonna stop here pretty much um, and just say there's a bunch of open questions for similar questions on spanners. Um, this is after I took out 20 slides. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> okay. All right, so what I would say is one of the, there are a bunch of open questions in these areas. There's a bunch of things we've done, but there's still a ton of open questions. Um, and one of the cool things that I think would be useful if there were good techniques for handling large degrees. 
to be not just sublinear in the number of nodes, but also sublinear in the degree. Uh, and I think that would be another, there, are, there is one technique right now out there, and that's it. That, but it would be really cool if there would be other such ideas. So I think that's where I'm going to stop. I just want to mention this talk was based on a survey for like a bunch of prop, a bunch of papers. Um, and thank you.